Okay, hello everyone, and this is Tehseen, your host from uh, Sales Funnel for Amazon FBA Brands. And today we have a very special guest. It's been a very long time since I asked him to come on the podcast, and he's finally got some time to get on with us. And ho- hopefully, we're going to learn a lot from him, and we are going to see a lot coming from him in the future as well, as we have uh, seen him releasing a lot of projects. And I think we have something secret coming in in a few uh, months' time as well. So. Welcome to the podcast, Tomer. How are you doing? Hi, Tishin. Very good to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, yeah. So uh, now your background is something that really intrigues me. And I have to ask, how did you find your way from magic to Amazon? Or did you just think Amazon is magic as well? Yeah. So uh, I've been into magic since I was 10 years old, all the way up until I was 27. I performed professionally all over Israel. I'm from Israel. So I've mm-hmm. uh, been doing a lot of shows on small, close-up um, places and like wedding receptions, stuff like that. And also on big stages, I also did like opening acts for comedians here a bit. Uh-huh. That was a lot of fun. I was even on, on TV at some point. I think that's still on YouTube somewhere. Uh, uh-huh. if, you, if you look it up. So um, yeah, that was uh, a lot of fun. I still uh, miss it uh, at times and I still do it from time to time for fun. Um, so what happened was I always knew I wanted to open my own business uh, my parents kind of pushed me to go into college at some point, so I did that as well. But then after that, I was—I had this boring nine-to-five job, hopefully the first and last job I ever have. And um, I was looking at what I, what else I can do after 5 p.m. And I didn't really want to watch, I don't know, um, TV or movies or go to clubs or whatever. Like that was, was never interesting to me. So mm-hmm. I was just uh, browsing through Facebook and Robert Kiyosaki, the guy who wrote uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, um basically advertised uh, at the time it was um amazing selling machine mm-hmm. so that's the course i took that was end of 2014 and back then i think that was by far the best course um um for like learning how to do amazon it wasn't cheap basically cost me all of the money i had in the bank at the time and then invested everything i got from that day job into inventory um so i launched in 2015 march 2015 and uh, first product took off pretty quickly. Um, and fast forward to today, now I'm running like multiple brands with a small team in the Philippines. Been speaking at pretty much every every event out there. Uh, in two weeks, I'm flying to speak at Helium 10 event. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, for the past uh, four years now, I've also been consulting seven, eight figure sellers on Amazon and also a few of the bigger aggregators in the space. Mm-hmm. So being uh, very fortunate and... Um, to kind of be one of, I think, one of the leading people uh, in the industry. And basically, uh, I love this industry. You know, I love the people. I love I love talking to sellers. And I think uh, it's very satisfying to help sellers and not just to sell physical products. Um, yeah. I would definitely agree with that. It's very satisfying to be in the community overall. You know, you, you love the vibe of the people and they're so optimistic about things and launching new brands, of course. Okay. So we seem to have a very uh, good uh audience of brand managers who are working with sellers just like you and you know maintaining and growing their brands one question that has plagued me time and time around is that okay so let's assume so first of all launching a product is not easy we all get that let's say we're successful in that we have a product in a non-saturated niche selling well for us you know just the perfect selling machine or the profit machine let's say but some big seller enters into the market or in the worst case, the manufacturer enters into the market and just takes all the market share. Like it just ruins it for you. How can we compete with that? That's the first thing. And how, what can we do about it? Yeah. So a few things I wanted to say about that. Like if you think about, let's, let's take other companies like Tesla, Mm -hmm. right. Or McDonald's like Tesla Mm -hmm. released like the electric car, but now they ran into a lot of difficulties because a lot of companies copy them, right? Yeah. So if they don't stay like 10 steps ahead, they're going to like lose all the market. Uh, McDonald's is obviously unhealthy, right? And they have to spend <laughs> billions of dollars to kind of stay uh, relevant and people will yeah. buy their products. Same thing with Coca-Cola. And I honestly think that bad products are going to go away from this world. Like I think okay. like if you look at cigarettes and if you look, like I think cigarettes are like, less and less over time, right? Like uh, people mm-hmm. are consuming less on cigarettes over time. People are consuming less unhealthy foods over time. So I think um, 
having a good product is like is what's next. So what I'm saying is that it doesn't matter if you and if you look at Apple, right? So Apple mm-hmm. was competing heavily with Beats and then just yeah. bought Beats because like <laughs> that was uh, the best option for them mm-hmm. uh, to just kind of that that's how they fought the competition. So uh, same thing with Facebook, Instagram, right? And now TikTok is rising. Yeah. So I mean, it's not a small company issue. It's any company issue. Like competition is always going to be there. And mm-hmm. what I will say is you just have to innovate and launch new products all the time. Like if you don't, uh, like usually what happens when you launch, it goes up like this, right? It goes uh, up mm-hmm. and then it starts to plateau. Like the yeah. business starts to plateau, maybe because demand gets lower, maybe because competition enters, prices mm-hmm. go down. That's just the nature of any product. doesn't matter what product it is. So okay. um, the only way to really scale is to expand to other marketplaces. Also launching variations is another thing you can do. To just stay ahead, like if you had, it depends on the product, right? But if mm-hmm. you're selling, I don't know what, like bed sheets, right? Let's say uh-huh. you're selling bed sheets and you only launched one color, queen size, like good luck with that, you know? But <laughs> if you are, if you look at the top sellers in bed sheets, you will see they have 200 variations on one listing, selling all the sizes, all the colors, and then mm-hmm. new players, it's a lot more difficult for them to come in and compete. Mm-hmm. So if you would just launch more of the same products in different listings, same listings, and try mm-hmm. to dominate that way, you will have much better chances to not allow uh, other cells to come in. Um, got it. Got it. So basically, yeah. just dominate the niche with everything possible so that you're able to dominate the game as much as you can. But at the end of the day, it's always going to be that way. So you also have to launch new products as well. Something yeah. complimentary is a good new thing. products but- as well. And also, like when you launch variations, a lot of people think I'm going to make more money. But not necessarily. Uh-huh. Sometimes you launch variations to defend your brand, you know, oh. and not just to, uh, to try to make more money. Because Got if it. you if you would think that, uh, let's say you are researching, let's say you are in product research mode and you look at your mm-hmm. own product and you say, oh, this uh-huh. is a good niche to go into, <laughs> what I would do differently. So maybe you can even innovate on your own product. Or let's say a competitor came mm-hmm. in with a better version of my product, right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to see if I can innovate on their product or maybe change my product to that, or I just launch a new SKU as the new version of that as product and just start again. Innovative so, version of the same product. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, you okay. just need to stay a few steps ahead. That's A few game. steps ahead. And that's a really good way to, you know, look into any business pretty much, right? Yeah. So, okay. Um, one more thing that, you know, we've seen in just in the last year, basically is, to, is a focus on external traffic and the focus of getting leads out of the customers that Amazon, you know, Amazon gives you sales, but you need to retain those customers as well. A good way of retaining those customers is to get leads from them or get them as leads pretty much. Now, can we use product inserts as a way to retain those customers as our customers or is that just not possible? Yeah, that's a good question. So the short answer is it's against COS. Like you cannot Uh really you're not really allowed to pull customers outside of Amazon. Mm-hmm. What we've been doing for the past few years and what I've been also teaching very big sales that they do and, and do really well is to basically use inserts to sell more products on Amazon. So okay. the way you do it is let's say you have an expensive electronic product selling for like a hundred mm-hmm. bucks, right? So imagine you have an insert saying you get a warranty, like a two year warranty if you just fill out your name and email, right? So you go in, okay out your name and email in something like Typeform. Typeform is a platform you can do like Google Forms. Google Form, pretty app. much. Um, pretty much in a Google Form. And it, it just looks really nice. Um, mm-hmm. So we use Typeform. But then when they say, when they fill it out, you say, okay, great, your warranty is now activated. And by the way, we just launched this new product on Amazon. And it's 50% okay. off. If you go to and you show, you can show them like the green coupon mm-hmm. uh, is 50% off or $20 off or whatever. Mm-hmm. If you go now, you can buy it for that for that amount, or you can mm-hmm. say, um, you can say uh, you can even give them like a one-time use coupon if you want. But that mm-hmm. cannot be over fifty percent off. So you can do different things, uh, or you can like we used rebates as well until recently. So uh-huh. um, uh, you can you can still do that if you if you really want to. That's a bit more risky, but yeah. like that whole thing, like that flow is not. I I don't really think it validates TOS. I'm not sending them outside of Amazon. I'm not doing mm-hmm. anything with that list i don't really need that list and if you think about there was a brand i consulted for doing 20 million dollars a year they have 100 people opting in every day on their inserts and if you think about like let's say five percent ten percent of them opt in on whatever offer they have mm-hmm. that's all they need to need to do new product launches and most brands i work with 
they can just do this one strategy. And if they sell two or three units a day every single day from that new product, that's probably mm -hmm. enough to launch it. Got it, got it. Yeah, so that's a very clever way of, you know, uh, having the, that same thing, but not, uh, you know, having having that US compliant as well. Okay, so the next question is a bit different one, let's just say. So now, what can we do to avoid negative reviews? Because if you're launching a product and you receive a negative review in the first five reviews, oftentimes that's just game over. And let's say we are uh, time along the way and we've had a good successful launch. We have 100 reviews now on the listing, but you know, even though the ne negative reviews can start coming in, what can we do about it? How can we identify what's the issue? And at the end of the day, what can we do with the supplier or the overall experience of our product so that we don't get those negative reviews? Yeah, so until recently, there was a lot you could do with negative reviews. I get the address of the customer, then send them letters and stuff like that. We did all of that. We were mm -hmm. probably one of the reasons Amazon removed phone numbers in a few years ago <laughs> because they were like harassing customers to change their reviews by calling them up. Mm -hmm. um, so there is not much you can do. So what we do now is, again, we focus on having better products. Uh, so we have a methodology called Six Star Experience um, where we basically aim for six stars to land at five. So imagine you get our product. Um, I mm -hmm. can give you maybe one example. So there was a product that I wanted to develop. It's also in my new book, but it was a product I wanted to develop. It's a lock picking set. Um, okay. So basically it teaches you how to pick locks. That's <laughs> forbidden to be sold in Amazon US, so you cannot really sell uh -huh. it there. But anyway, that's the product and we couldn't sell, so that's why I can share it. But basically, instead of bringing it in like a regular color box, my idea was let's put it in something that looks like a deposit box. So it's black all around and okay. has like a small lock in the front. Uh -huh. So, um, and it just like in the picture, you know, like a lock in the front and then on the bottom of it, then you have like the text made in China or whatever, all of that. Mm -hmm. But then when you open up the box, it has a note that says, congrats, you've just picked your first lock. Like that was the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so then like it's a tool set, right? So you get like 20 tools inside. So imagine mm -hmm. this, imagine that you got this product either as a gift or for yourself or whatever. And then um, two pieces are missing inside, right? If there was nothing, if it was just like a brown box or a color box or whatever and no notes or anything, just a standard product, you would mm -hmm. probably go in and leave a, review, a negative review or place a refund or whatever. But in this case, when you got the packaging, you don't know what it is, you open it up, you're surprised, you're laughing, maybe you're smiling. So mm -hmm. you already got more than what you paid for. You already got more value than what you've expected. Uh -huh. So now you're not that eager to leave a negative review. You will probably reach out to customer support first or Amazon mm -hmm. or whatever, but basically we'll probably do that first because you kind of feel obligated to. So oh, okay. um, we might, there was another product we sold uh, make a breast sets. Mm -hmm. So what we did there is we had these um, small things to kind of clean your face with. And we just dumped it into the packaging, into the box and didn't get any feedback on it in the reviews. Like no one mentioned it. It's not in the listing, but we just a surprise product. Mm -hmm. Surprise! If no one mentioned it, and then what we did is we just put it in like a, a small black box with a red ribbon around it and had a small uh -huh. note next to it. And then we got a lot of positive reviews as a result because they okay. they knew it's actually an extra gift they didn't expect. And again, it was like 10 brushes. And if a brush was missing, then they will contact us before placing a refund because they got more than they paid for. Uh -huh. so, so, yeah. so mm -hmm. what I would say is that you're basically... It's not, there, there is an old thing that says like under promise and over deliver and stuff like that, but mm -hmm. it's not even that, you know, I think it's really just doing good business and just being like a better, having better products and better customer experience. And that's what you should really focus on because Amazon's game is reviews. So if you think about reviews, you cannot, anything that is under five stars actually hurts you a lot, right? Even if it's four stars, it really hurts you a lot. So if you're not getting consistent five-star reviews, and if you get like for one-star review for every 10 five-star reviews, you're going to lose, right? Very yeah. quickly. <laughs> so you need a lot of five-star reviews um, to, in order not to lose. So in order not to go under 4.5-star rating. Mm -hmm. So if you think about it, like the only way to do that is to really give a very, very good experience and not to look like every other product they buy on Amazon. Got it. So basically... A dozen of 13 that's what the strategy is right you know going the extra mile to make sure that even if the customer has you know some bad experience of product not in the correct form or the or the, yeah. the packaging is damaged they will still want to you know talk to you rather than leaving a 
bad review. Right. Got it. And there Basically. are great websites that can help you, like 99designs can help you with creating a unique packaging. And uh -huh. Squad Help is a great website that can come up with funny phrases or funny sayings by like doing it with a like, big crowd that basically asks them for like, uh -huh. what's a good line for yoga mats, right? For seniors or whatever you want. Like, uh -huh. um, so that's uh, definitely one, like a few websites you can use and tools. And the, the thing I said about the, uh, like the makeup brush set, like that costs you more money, right? To give that extra thing right. inside in a box. Mm -hmm. But that thing about the lock picking sets costs zero extra. Right? Because you can just design that. Yeah. at one time got it exactly you know with a lot of brands you only need like one thing mm -hmm. and that's it you just do the same thing across the brand you don't need more than that got it got it okay so one question that uh i i was just having a conversation with one of my friends who's also running an agency and you know they're working with a lot of brands and i we had a disagreement on something so my question was that if I have a hero's queue, you know, you have a hero's queue that sells pretty much all of your inventory or stock, and then you have a lot of other products that you're working on. If you receive negative reviews on some of the new products that you have, would that affect my branded other products? So let's say if I'm having negative reviews on new listings or old listings, would that affect my overall store on Amazon? Or is it just not relevant to that? Yeah, so... I don't think so. I don't think people are going to your store and saying, oh, this is a five-star product and it's a three-star product. I'm not going to buy from this brand. I don't, I don't think that that's going on. I think mm -hmm. people are buying on Amazon. So they don't really care about your other products. They don't really see them. They will mm -hmm. see like freaking the bot together and Amazon will help you push more products from your store if people are buying them. What it uh -huh. will do is it will hurt your exit. Like if you have uh -huh. one hero skew and then you have 10 more products that are not performing, and let's say they have a 5% margin and your hero product has a 20% margin, that just brings the entire store down to a lower margin and that can really hurt your exit. So right. when I, one of our services now is basically helping sellers scale towards an exit. And what we do there is we look at like the low performing SKUs and we might even cut them off. They might even make profit to the brand, but because the margin is so low, it actually brings the margin of the entire store down. So we prefer to right. stay on like... 18%, 20% margin if we can for the brand instead mm -hmm. of having like a 10% margin at a higher profit because that's not very interesting to buyers. So um, you really want to focus. On, and if you only have one hero SKU doing like, I don't know, 50K a month and then like 10 more SKUs doing 2K a month, it's just a lot more difficult to sell that brand because it's not a brand. You sell one product. So you exactly. cannot say this is a brand. Um, there was a very big brand, Thrasio, but like... Uh, I don't know, two years ago when the multiples were high, but mm -hmm. it was like a $20 million brand, but really one product. They had other products in the brand, but didn't really do anything. Uh -huh. And the multiple was like 1.5. And no one, no other aggregator wanted to touch that brand, you know, because it's such a big risk. To it's take just like one, one product, product right? selling for 20 bucks, having like a list of huge competitors. That's the number one bestseller. Mm -hmm. But still, it's just very difficult to justify buying such a brand. That makes sense. That makes complete sense, actually. Okay, so uh, let's just shift the conversation a bit to people who just want to start right now. So what exactly is your context behind a criteria that one can use to find new products or rather unsaturated niches to sell on Amazon? Yeah, good question. So... Uh... I did like full lectures on this topic. I have, if you go to our website, I've seen a lot of your lectures, by the way. Yeah, if you go to jointopdog.com, you will see like a product section workshops, like a free two and a half hour workshop. So anyone can check that out. Mm -hmm. But very quickly, I will say that uh, the main thing you want to avoid is obviously looking where everyone else is looking. Now, that's what everyone is saying. But the problem is that everyone is teaching the same thing. Okay. Everyone is saying, find like an easy to launch product, one piece, light, small between $15 to $60 in yeah. specific categories. Mm -hmm. Don't do electronic. Don't do like FDA approved. Don't do heavy, expensive, like all of that, right? Exactly. I'm saying go the opposite direction because if you do what they say, you will basically stumble upon the same exact products as everyone else. I talked to a lot of sellers. I think okay. in the past month, there are basically two products that I saw like maybe 10 times from <laughs> sellers. Like the same two products from 10 different sellers saying, I want to launch this. I'm like, good luck with that. So okay. if you found that perfect product, right, that mm -hmm. pro product that fits the entire criteria, and those products exist, like a lot of them, 
But if you did find it and it doesn't seem saturated now, it will be saturated by the time you launch it, for sure. Okay. So if you think about selling your brand or being a sustainable business, you want to sell the product for at least six to eight years because if you want to exit in two, three years from now, the buyer wants the product to keep selling after, right? <laughs> so if it Thanks. becomes saturated, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So if you think about it, let's say you launch a product that is expensive, heavy, requires FDA, electronic, right? Mm -hmm. You won't have a lot of competitors tomorrow morning on Amazon. So That's I, I, I rather fight in the sourcing and product development part uh -huh. and not fight every day with uh, bringing the prices Competition. down on Amazon with 20 competitors coming in every day. Um, so I really think you need products that have barrier of entry. It doesn't mean you need patented products necessarily. It doesn't mean you need like two years of development of the product. It mm -hmm. just means look for products. We have products that are selling for $9, $10. We have products that like no one wants to touch. Um, because no one is looking in those places. So that's one thing that you can do. Uh -huh. The other thing is really target specific niches. Like if yoga mat is too competitive, you can launch yoga mat for seniors if that keyword is being searched a lot by potential customers, right? So you mm -hmm. can basically target, uh, if you look at any saturated product in the world, doesn't matter what it is, there will always be like sub niches popping in. So mm -hmm. that's why Amazon will never be saturated. Um, that, okay. that's what I believe at least. So, uh, we are doing a lot of work on like targeting specific niches and uses and stuff like that with different product mm -hmm. launches. Uh, Got it. And Got again, it. that's covering a lot of detail in the workshop. Okay. Yeah. So we're definitely going to have a link for one of your uh, seminars on product development. Uh, cool. I, I think it, it's been a year pretty much then when, when I watched one of your product seminars and it was absolutely opposite of what everyone teaches on YouTube for free, right? And they have a very good uh, affiliate link right below to it, the software. Most of them are selling uh, Helium 10 yeah, black yeah. box as well, the... Yeah, yeah, I understand, yeah. Yeah, cool. Okay, so uh, once we find the right product, what do we do next? How do we get the right supply? Because as you mentioned, we're gonna sell heavy FDA approval supply things that require a lot of working in the product supply phase as well. So we are trying to find suppliers, but they don't have the right model or they are not willing to talk to us for less number of units, or maybe uh, they're not willing to develop the right model that we want to you know, sell in the market. How do we go about that part? Yeah, so suppliers is um, it, like a lot of them are not that easy to deal with. I think it's just a matter of experience over time in mm -hmm. finding the right supplier for you. Um, again, in my book, at least like there are a lot of a lot of different tips on how to handle suppliers and stuff like that. I don't know if that's uh, something we can go into a lot of detail on right now. Um, what I will say is that whatever samples you get from your supplier, if it's not good enough quality, just know it's the best quality you'll get. Because the supplier, what they do is... Um, Let's say they produce like 500 of these, right? Or whatever. Uh -huh. The one sample they send to you is the best one. They're not going to send okay. you like a product that's not performing <laughs> well. So yeah. if the sample is not good enough, just don't launch that product. And I don't care if it's the fifth sample you got from the fifth supplier that you worked with for the past six months. Mm -hmm. It takes you forever to get to that point. Do not launch the product if it doesn't work as it should. Uh, the number one reason for one-star reviews is the product just doesn't work, right? <laughs> so you will need to avoid that as much as possible. So mm -hmm. what I tell sellers, especially those advanced ones, is that you should always have five to 10 products in your pipeline at any mm -hmm. given time, because some products might take three months from research until launch, and some products might take a year. And, but if you have a lot of products you're working on, it's fine. And a product right. can basically fall at any point in the pod development and research phase. Maybe your research is saturated, you drop it. Or maybe you research, you get samples, and then you drop it. Maybe you research... You get samples, you do a lot of iterations and improvements, and then it's too expensive, so it doesn't make any sense launching it anymore. Or maybe by the time you kind of got the samples, it's been a year, you check Amazon again, and now it's saturated, so you don't want to do it. So it just depends on the product, right? And you just, so that's why you need more products in your pipeline mm -hmm. um, to work in. And what I will say for beginners, like you asked me, like uh, the last question about the product selection, I will say that the first one, two products that you select just launch anything. Just kind okay. of understand the process and don't okay. waste two years on your first product. Like that makes no sense. You just want to do it quickly because 
you will learn so much by launching a product mm -hmm. and then you can do it the right way afterwards. And if the first product is a hit, great. But don't waste like, I don't know, 10, 20K on the first product launch mm -hmm. unless you have like 10X that in, in the bank. Um, got it, yeah. got it. That, that, that 10X part is very important because a lot of people in the community that we uh, belong, I belong to and they've spent life savings on an Amazon launch. And I just talked to them and I sympathize with them because, you know, they've lost a lot of it because when they are selling a garlic press pretty much. And for example, you know, as you mentioned as well, right, you, you, see, you see 10 people getting the same product at the same time. And I've even seen like seasons of it. So for example, if it's summer, I know this product is trending right now, but by the time they launch it, it's going to be winter and then they will sell nothing at all. And in the next four months, they will just go bankrupt because they will not be able to at the storage cost as well so yeah. uh now you have a community of you know over 200 amazon sellers but you guys have a filter on it saying you only work with experienced sellers can you tell me why that is i just want to understand the reason why you only work with experienced sellers and maybe not with people who want to start right now yeah so when i started out uh i was consulting beginner sellers as well uh different times but i realized that their mindset is in the wrong place uh -huh. a lot of times like to me it's just a lot more difficult to coach someone that has like a full-time job at the same time or their mindset is not in the right place and they're always worried about the, the amount they pay for anything and they're not thinking uh long term on things so uh that's why i really focused on seven eight figure sellers Mm -hmm. uh, for the past few years now, and also aggregators. Um, what I will say is that my entire thing, and I think like success, like if you think about success in general, it's uh -huh. being measured by multiple things. But to me, one of the one of the things um, I think we are measured by is how many people we get to help. You know, so mm -hmm. I really like helping sellers as much as I can. If people message me on Facebook, LinkedIn, I just help them out. I don't kind of charge them anything for it. It doesn't uh -huh. matter if it's a small seller or big seller because the money I make from consulting doesn't come from me consulting even in seven, eight or figure sellers. It mainly comes from me kind of partnering up with them on their brand towards an exit or it comes mm -hmm. from me consulting aggregators or bigger companies like nine figure companies mm -hmm. and then taking equity from their business. So that's where I make my money. Um, so anything else is basically you can call it leads or I don't know building my name up or whatever, but I don't really see it that way. I just want to help as many people as I can. So that's why I wrote this book right here. Write the Amazon uh, Wave. Write the Amazon Wave because, I mean, it took me two years to complete, but that way I can reach everyone potentially, right? Everyone who yeah. wants to kind of listen to me or, or likes what I have to say, they can buy the book for an affordable price um, globally. So um, that, that was one of the reasons that got me to write a book because I knew... I cannot uh, put out, uh, like I, I did workshops online and I did like, you, you watch the training of mine online. So that can get to a, a certain amount of people. But I feel like if I write a book, like and the workshops are kind of like, you, they have a time capacity. You cannot really watch the same workshop like three <laughs> years after when it's Amazon. And I didn't want to do a podcast or a blog or something that I kind of need to update all the time. So mm -hmm. I like the thought of having a book and I wrote the book in a way that it's almost timeless. Like the concepts in the book should always be true when selling on Amazon. So that's what I tried to create with this book. Um, already got very good feedback. Like it launched two months ago, sold a few thousand copies by now. So it's going really well. Um, and yeah, I it's like 300 pages and the book was written for active sellers. It's not like, how to sell an Amazon book. It's you already <laughs> launched a few products. You already mm -hmm. seen some success. This is how you can scale your business. This is how you can treat it as an actual business. And I talk about uh, obviously product research and sourcing and what we talked about today, but also team building, hiring, creating systems, processes, exiting your business if that's what you want. There are a lot of personal stories in there, cartoons in the book. Like it's, it's just rich with a lot of different uh, surprises throughout. So um, yeah. <laughs> got it and uh do you have any audiobook is for this as well or no yeah the audiobook will come uh soon like maybe mm -hmm. depending on when you're listening to this but maybe it's out already so you can just check right the amazon wave on amazon mm -hmm. uh, and see but there is a kindle version physical paper copy hardcover and audio is coming soon as well got it so now you've pretty much covered everything that i wanted to ask 
only question I have is I was at your about about me page on your website and this one question right over there. What is the secret thing that you're working right now? Yeah, so and when can we uh, expect it at least? Yeah, yeah. No, I'm working on multiple things at any given moment, but uh there are like three different projects. I don't know which one which uh -huh. one of them will come will come first, to be honest. But uh yeah, I cannot really share anything, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, about them it's just like i still don't know what i'm gonna do like once i kind of obligate to one of them i'll probably kind of talk about it i can message you once once okay. uh, one of them is at once least, uh, something comes up uh, yeah something comes up yeah got it um thank you so much for taking the time out to have this podcast uh we are gonna give away some of your books some copies of your books to the uh, listeners on this podcast so just as a prize for them coming in and tuning into the podcast and as you shared, you help out almost everyone. Uh, do you have any community or a, or a Facebook group that you, where people can reach you out or just the f profile is good? No, just Facebook is good. LinkedIn is good. You can also mm -hmm. email me at tomar at jointalkdog.com directly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and if you also get the book, there is a lot more free content there. Like there are basically what I'm trying to do with the book is like the book is timeless, but then the content on the back end is going to be updated um as long as i'm in this game so okay got it